Switching converters. We all know them, we love them. They basically drive the world as we know it. From your laptop or computer uh, to electric vehicles, generation, storage, solar, battery powered, cell phones, etc. Everything we use uh, this day basically has a form of switching converter inside. Well, switching converters have many advantages over their traditional counterparts, which are uh, linear supplies, but they also have a few drawbacks. And before you have a selection of switching converters, some of which, well, actually one of them I've designed myself, and the others are pulled out of various things. This is a power supply from a camera, this is a um, LED driver, and this is a, I think, a boost converter that takes two to something volts and spits out six volts. It's one of those Pololo thingies. So, switching converters work by basically chopping up a voltage and feeding it through an inductive device of some sort, either a transformer or a inductor or something else, and by modulating the input voltage, the uh, duty cycle of the switching, etc, etc, we can get higher, lower voltages, isolated voltages, etc. Well, why am I talking about switching converters when the title is, of course, Revisiting Jim Williams. Well, Jim Williams was a uh, analog designer, I think, for analog devices back in the day after he left National Instruments. And he was one of the greatest electronics engineers and designers who have ever lived. He sadly passed away a few years back and um, he left behind a legacy of extraordinary um, electronic knowledge, a wealth of information, all of which is accessible through his application notes, both the ones he wrote for National Instruments and the ones he wrote for Linear Technologies, now owned by Analog Devices. So, switching converters uh, have gone extremely, um, have become extremely common, and uh, they're so common that for example, a modern GPU has in excess of six phases of buck converters inside to power the core voltage for the GPU itself. Um, processors have a lot more than that, um, and F stuff like FPGAs and application-specific integrated circuits, which draw a lot of power, um, usually rely on very carefully designed buck converters to supply their um, core voltages with high efficiency and extremely tight transient uh, behaviors. So when the CPU starts boosting, for example, and it draws insane amounts of current in the order of 100 amps, at one volt, the controller has to make sure that the voltage applied to the core doesn't go below a specific threshold, otherwise the CPU brownout protection uh, kicks in and you don't have a CPU anymore, you have a brick. Or when the CPU stops boosting and the load suddenly disappears, um, you don't want any overshoot, which would yet again destroy your processor. So, a little side note, this is not the first Jim Williams uh, design that I've revisited. The first one is actually his um, quiet, low-noise, high-voltage supply, which you can see incarnated here. Uh, this was quite a challenge because of a few factors, first of which is that the magnetics he used are kind of hard to find. Um, this is based on the LT1534 control transition uh, switching controller and it's basically a negative one kilovolt power supply which uh, boasts very good uh, noise performance. This is not the final version <clears throat> and it's uh, gonna have to have another revision or two as you can see there's a few bodges. 
we might go into a bit more detail on this one and a bit of like if there is enough interest. But what we're going to talk about today is a sorry about the parallel on the sidetrack. Uh, we're going to talk about his application note 133, which is a 100 ampere dynamic load with in excess of 500 kilohertz of bandwidth. And this was by far the most challenging electronics project I ever underwent. So this is the first prototype. It works very well, but there is a, a number of bodges that I have had to do in order to uh, get it to work. As you can see, there is a um, error in the layout where I reversed a few pins and honestly that was the only mistake that I did, but it needed some wires um, to be, uh, some traces to be cut and some wires to be soldered. Anyway, um, let's get back to the topic at hand. What is this thing? So, uh, as I said, processors and application specific integrated circuits, FPGAs, have a lot of voltage um, power supplies and requirements. Uh, for example, they might have an I.O. ring which runs off 1.8 volts or something like that. They might have several core voltages, each running at, I don't know, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1, 1 1.2 volts, something like that. Uh, my CPU and my computer runs at about 1.4 volts. And it draws up to 100 and something amps under full load, which is a considerable amount of power. Right, And when you design a buck converter of, capable of supplying that kind of power at such a low voltage, um, you want to make sure that it's also stable under so-called transient loads. So what is a transient load? Well, a transient load is basically a sudden change in the power requirements that the device uh, which is being powered um, goes through. So, for example, as I said, a processor starts boosting, it draws a lot more power, the voltage has to say, stay about the same, so the converter or the controller for the converter has to take action in order to maintain a specific stability in the output voltage. Okay, and this device right here is my interpretation of Jim's application note 130, 133. Um, it's based around a, it's in theory quite simple, being just a MOSFET which is driven as to act like a constant current source. And um, an input signal dictates the magnitude of the current that uh, the MOSFET is, is sinking. Well, the devil is always in the details, so the bandwidth of this uh, thing, this finished product, um, Jim uh, specified it as 540 kilohertz, which is insane. Like getting a 600 ish nanosecond rice time on a 100 ampere load is very very difficult there are commercial products that do that and they're probably based on the same topology that i'm showing here but i hope i'm not infringing on any copyright this is not a commercial product i am going to open source it and it's heavily based on jim's application note the only thing I um, actually did was design a pcb that would meet the requirements and update some of the components in order to, you know, there's some transistors that went obsolete from here. And um, I actually swapped the main uh, transistor, the main MOSFET that syncs the current to a far more modern one uh, made by Infineon. So this part number, I'll link it in below. It's a 150-ish amp MOSFET. It's got a maximum drain source voltage of around 25 volts. But what separates it from the crowd is it's extremely good um, input capacitance. So the gate capacitance is it's only two nanofarads, which is fabulous. The MOSFET Jim initially used was uh, still an Infineon part number, but it was an older MOSFET. 
and it had a whopping 28 nano farads of uh, gate capacitance, which is extremely hard to drive with any reasonably fast uh, rise times and fault times. So um, what we have, broadly speaking, is a section here which takes 15 volts plus and minus and regulates it down to plus minus 5 volts for a couple of the components here. And then we have some extra filtering for the op amps and comparators we have around. We have a biasing circuit for the gate drive. The gate drive is discrete, made out of a complementary pair of two N3904 and N3906. And um, we have a dissipation protector, which makes sure that um, if the pulse width at the input exceeds a specific length, which is set to around 10 microseconds, uh, a comparator trips and disables the gate drive of the MOSFET, which in turn disables the sinking of the current. And we have a very fast video um, amplifier. It's a fully differential amplifier sensing the voltage drop over a one milliohm shunt, which is fed back into the feedback, feedback, sorry about the information, it's kind of awkward, uh, which serves as the feedback for the circuit. So the voltage across that shunt resistor in millivolts equals basically um, the current uh, sunk and by the load. So it goes back and the feedback loop does what it's supposed to do, etc, etc. Okay, why did I decide to build this thing? Well, uh, an exercise in both very high uh, technological standards of construction for a PCB and um, I wanted to see if it's actually uh, possible to do a product that could be easily soldered to the point of load of a regulator. So for example, if this was the 100 amp buck converter to minimize the inductances, you'd solder this over the output, connect the input and the current monitor outputs uh, to your signal generator and your oscilloscope, and then set up your measurement, etc., etc. And I think that this form factor is quite reasonable, actually. Um, we'll talk about the heat sinks a bit later. But um, yeah, that was the main goal. Make it small, make it perform very well, and um, make it actually work, first of all, because it proved to be quite a challenge in itself. So, how would you go about designing something like this? Well, first of all, I read um, AN133, which dates back to October 2011, which is like 11 years ago now. Um, and it, this application note is just beautifully written as everything that Jim has ever written. And it goes into, first of all, a very rudimentary setup. How would you be able to do that? And then he gets into a block diagram. And then he gives us a fully drawn schematic with all the components, with everything required to get this to work. And there's a uh, startup procedure, the commissioning procedure, he calls it something else, I can't remember exactly, um, described carefully a bit later in the document. But first of all, let's analyze the schematic a bit. So. First of all, this is the gate drive, as I said, complementary uh, bipolar transistor output, um, three ohms to the gate of the MOSFET. And there is a thermal switch that I didn't include, um, which opens at 70 degrees centigrade, so it protects the MOSFET from the thermal destruction. Um, this is a input filtering uh, network which basically band limits the uh, entire device to around 2 megahertz. This is the dissipation limiter that I talked about. We have a negative 5 volts which generates a few milliohm, millivolts of uh, voltage on the inverting input of the competitor. competitor. 
and then we have a 33k charging a 10 microfarad capacitor on the positive input when this uh, voltage here goes below the negative input which is preset the comparator trips and it uh, pulls down the gate of this MOSFET which in turn pulls down um, the gate of this transistor which disables the gate drive. Um, this trim potentiometer here sets basically a offset for the entire device for the uh, baseline current so when there is no input applied the baseline current is set by this potentiometer here this is the loop compensation for the uh, circuit. This serves to compensate for um, basically the uh, MOSFETs response. And then we have a biasing region here, which is based around the LT1004 um, Zener diode. It sets a 10 milliamp current through this resistor, uh, which is one ohm. So it makes sure that there's always going to be 10 millivolts over this resistor by driving the gate of this MOSFET here. Now, a VN2222 isn't really that easy to find, same for this one, so I replaced a few of the parts. And in order to make the circuit more compact, I actually switched to basically everything is SMD now. Um, the MOSFET that Jim used was a 15N04LG and the um, other change that I made with the circuit was I messed around with the gain a bit because I wasn't getting um, good results, I don't know, something probably related to the construction of the thing. Uh, when you have a milliohm of shunt resistor, milliohms in the PCB are 100% error, basically. So uh, instead of getting 1 volt for 100 amps, I got actually 300 millivolts output for 100 amps. Okay, this is the feedback, the current feedback. It's a very interesting differential amplifier. I've actually never heard of this part before looking at uh, Jim's schematic. Um, what's so interesting about this uh, operational amplifier is that it's very, very hard to understand. At least it was for me. So it's basically a differential amplifier. Um, I couldn't really figure out which terminal he was using for the feedback initially. Then I had to step back and look at it and I realized, yeah, there's got to be another input on this thing which is tied to ground. The feedback is negative feedback, of course, because otherwise it would have been an oscillator, etc., etc. So, this is a aerial view of how the schematic works. We give it a negative going pulse. This operational amplifier drives the gate drive stage, which drives the gate of the transistor. Transistor starts pulling current from the power supply under test. Um, causing a voltage drop to appear across the shunt resistor. Shunt resistor voltage drop is sensed by the current sense amplifier, fed back, and everything is nice and controlled, and the loop is compensated, everything works fine. That's in theory. Right, um, inductance. Well, inductance is the devil, because any inductance with stents resists changes in current. So in order to get a reasonably fast rise time for the um, current pulse, we need to minimize all the inductances everywhere, which is what Jim said right here, minimize inductance. Um, now, this might seem like a trivial task, but trust me, it isn't. Um, we're lucky enough to have a um, Keysight 4990 uh, impedance analyzer at work and I actually tested the inductance, the parasitic inductance of the vias and this PCB and um, I figured out that without plugging the vias with a considerable amount of solder I was getting almost 100 nanohenries of inductance which is intolerable. After I flooded everything with solder, 
it dropped to like single digit nano henrys which is acceptable right there's only so much you can do in the compensation for the device now jim goes into his beautiful uh screen captures from i'm pretty sure he had a triple five uh tektronix oscilloscope that he always used and he shows uh over damped under damped uh responses what happens with um the circuit when you don't tune it properly and what to do to tune it properly um this is again going into inductance 20 nano henrys is enough to ruin the uh rise time of the circuit um and i also have an example related to this this is a 120 amp uh, power supply, still an eight LT uh, LT design. Uh, it's specifically made for low voltage, high current devices like CPUs, FPGAs, stuff like that. And this is basically the main application for a circuit like this. It's validating and evaluating the behavior of such a uh, regulator under very, very, very ridiculous transient loads. And this is basically kind of the end of the useful information uh, in the, like, it's never the end of the useful information, but it's the end of the performance specifications of the circuit. Uh, and this is where uh, the verification that both the top and the bottom side currents of the MOSFET are equal due to the fact that it's such a large MOSFET and um, capacitances all over it are very significant. Jim expected to have a difference in the, f the current going through the drain and the source, but it proved not to be uh, a problem because, of course, it didn't because he's a genius. And this is the trimming procedure, which should be followed religiously. Um, otherwise, you're going to... Um, brick a bunch of expensive MOSFETs. Right, okay, so we saw the schematic, we sort of understood the theory of, theory of operation of the device, it's described in the application notes far better than I can do it. Uh, I can barely do it justice because it's just incredible. Like, to me, a relatively inexperienced electronics engineer um, this is not RF black magic, but it's analog black magic. Now that I spent weeks working on this project and have delved deeper into the whole thing, I'm confident enough to say that I barely understand it. Hopefully some of you smart viewers, most of you are smarter than I am, uh, will be able to make more sense of uh, what's going on here. And I love the end of uh, the document in traditional Jim Williams fashion, power uncorrupted. This is uh, a bastardized quote from Lord Acton. Lord Acton said that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, here we have absolute power non-corrupted. So Jim is a, was a known prankster and very humorous person. Okay, so let's fire up LT Spice. And let's see what we um, came up with here. So, um, this is the circuit as Jim designed it, but with several components updated by yours truly. So, first of all, I kept the biasing the same. I changed two of the MOSFETs because... I couldn't find any SMD packages for the MOSFETs that Jim used. And that took a bit of trial and error because, you know, different MOSFETs, different characteristics, different behaviors, etc., etc. Um, I didn't actually have any LT1220s on hand, so I initially uh, simulated the circuit with a LT1128, which we can do right now. And uh, you're going to see a degradation in performance, but that's not a big deal. 
the only thing that changes is this capacitor should be more like 27 picofarads. Okay, so what we have here is basically a not a pulse. I'm going to show you a pulse response soon, but we have a sort of Haversign input looking uh, signal. So let's run the simulation. My computer is plenty fast, so we shouldn't be waiting too long for this. So this is the input pulse. I couldn't figure out how to just get rid of that thing, but it ignores completely any um, positive going signals. And if we put a current probe here, we can see that because I changed this back to an LT1128, there's a significant amount of overshoot. Now, if I go back and change this to a LT1220, you'll see that the circuit improves in performance dramatically. Okay, I hope it's recording and I hope you can see this. So what we have here is a 10 microsecond long signal translating into a 10 microsecond burst of sort of sine wavy um, current draw. Um, let's get rid of that sign. Let's give the thing the full uh, negative one volt pulse. And let's look a bit closer at the rise time. So as you can see, this is in theory, beautiful, completely beautiful. It's a hundred amps. I trimmed the values here to get exactly a hundred amps. Um, there's nigh on no overshoot, no distortion in the trailing or leading edge. We can even reduce this uh, capacitor here to increase our rise time. Um, you can see it got a bit sharper. We can go even drastically lower than that. But um, it's in the diminishing returns region. So. One thing that I wanted to show you is if we go and look at the gate current of this MOSFET, you can see that the peak drive that the circuit, the gate driver, has to supply to this transistor is remarkable. It's almost 10 milliamps. So, yeah, it's a 10 milliamp peak, but very short pulse in order to discharge the capacitance of the uh, gate of the MOSFET. <clears throat> And how did I end up uh, selecting this MOSFET? Well, you go to pick new MOSFET and you choose one with the smallest gate charge and the smallest on resistance. And turns out that um, the smallest one that I could find that would satisfy the 150-ish amp uh, peak uh, uh, continuous drain current that I could find was a BSC 15N. L N E L N E two L S five I. I'm sorry, I'm a bit um, ill at the moment. So B S C. You can see that the data sheets have been uh, thoroughly browsed. So this MOSFET right here is a very very impressive looking MOSFET made by Infineon. Um, I actually work for Infineon, but not in the MOSFET, uh, not in the power semiconductor department. So. I was lucky enough to get this as a uh, sample for no cost. Um, P current 147 amps and the figure of merit is described into uh, in these in the data sheets for these things as the gate input capacitance or a ratio to the drain current. So uh, that's the figure of merit. So the higher cur drain current versus input capacitance, the lower the um, the better the figure of merit. Now you can see that still uh, two nanofarad is in pretty significant uh, input capacitance, but compared to the initial um, device used in the 
um, in Jim's application note, this has a 28,000 pico thread input capacitance. You can see it right here. So, and it's got the same on resistance. So the uh, input capacitance is more than uh, 10 times smaller for the same drain current and the same on resistance. Okay, so after we did all of this, uh, we simulated the circuit, we picked our components, we have a pretty certain idea of what the circuit is going to behave like. Um, what, are, what are the next things that we need to do? Well, first of all, we need to figure out the um, regulators for the plus and minus 5 volts, and that was pretty easy to do. I just picked a 78L05 and 79L05. So, basically 7805 series regulators plus and minus polarity and they're in a SMD package. So after we did all this, um, that was the least of the concerns because any old regulator would have worked there. Um, after we did all this, what do we have to do? Well, we have to start our uh, EDA program and um, get a layout going. So I'll be right back. And we can talk about the um, layout of the PCB a bit. Right, so what you can see on the screen, hopefully, is the PCB as it stands. Um, I didn't have any SMA connectors which pointed up, so I had to make do... Yeah, I wouldn't call this a bodge, but it's a design variant. Right, so... You can see, let me uh, crack open the schematic a bit first. This is actually corrected now. The botch that I um, had to do was due to the fact that pins 3 and 2 on the LT1193 were actually reversed. So, uh, input filter, bio dissipation limiter, LEDs, um, gate drive disable MOSFET, control amplifier, gate drive section, uh, biasing, and the current feedback are all here. I uh, killed the, um, like I hid the uh, comments for all the parts because it was getting very crowded. But one of the coolest things in Altium is that we have a tool called Manufacturer Part Search where we can just say, I want an LTZ 1000, for example. And if I place it, I don't need an LTZ-1000 for the schematic, I'm just showing you what's uh, what's up. So if I place it, the uh, component is already drawn, the symbol is already drawn, the footprint is drawn, the 3D model is available, and it's one of the most powerful tools I've ever seen for an EDA software like this. Uh, and you can, have, uh, you can actually have also the stock availability um in real time so um i picked all of the components uh one in 4148 for all the diodes this is a 6.8 volt scener you can see that the packages are um and uh, excuse me you can see that the packages are all most of them are 060805 and the uh, leds are 0603 because LEDs are kind of hard to find larger packages than this and um, I did a layout which looks okay but it's not that great right now um, yeah I got it in four layers and I did a few tricks uh, in order to get a bit lower inductance in the vias as such as filling the vias up with solder. I um, stripped the solder uh, the solder mask off of these sections here to let me you know fill the thing with solder and reduce the uh, resistance and uh, all the trimmers are these Borns SMD multi-turn trimmers with the exception of this one 
which is the FET response compensation, which doesn't really need to be a uh, multi-term potentiometer. Um, this is the 1193 with its associated decoupling, blah, blah, blah. And then what we do next is we go to one of the multitude of PCB manufacturers and ask them for a PCB. I, ask, I actually asked them for 10 and I paid for these out of my own pocket because, you know, it was like 30 bucks with shipping for 10 four layer boards with a stencil. And let me fetch the stencil. <clears throat> now, stencils are very hard to film, but this is the part that really gets me. How can they give you a stencil this size, like it's giant, for $6? It's crazy. Okay, and then I um, used some solder paste and a credit card to spread the, you know, paste assembly. I don't really think you want to see that because it's kind of boring. Um, what I can actually show you is I have a massive box of components that I actually ordered and um, they arrived from Mauser in about three days, which is exceptional. And uh, yeah, bags of components. And then the semi-automated pick and place machine, yours truly again, had to assemble all of these components onto the board. Apologies for the noise and the off the cuff feeling of this video, but it's uh, the best that I can do for the moment. And I soldered them using this thing, which is very stupid. This is a um, aluminum PCB. It's one of those uh, $2 for five thing, five bucks uh, promotions. It's the biggest one that I could find. It's a hundred by a hundred millimeters. So one of these PCBs were comfortably fit on here. I only populated the top and uh, ignored the J1 and J2. The actual terminals that I used were these two. I hooked it up to a power supply. It's in the neighborhood of like 10 ohms or something like that. Fed it 100 watts, got very hot. I started tweaking the voltage uh, while watching a thermometer. Um, and then I helped reflow the components with some hot air. I'll insert... I'll try and insert a small clip of um, um, what that looks like. It's actually very, very satisfying to see all the components magically uh, fall into place and wetting out. And um, yeah, and the finished product is this. Now, um, you might have seen that Jim and uh, the application notes says that you need um, lots of decoupling in order to get um, the circuit to work so then I had to get cracking on that and here's what I came up with it's um, thank you Bogdan for the math um, it's 10,000 microfarads of uh, electrolytics actually 9,000 and um, another 500 microfarads of uh, capacitance in uh, ceramics uh, mixed values in there all the biggest ones that I could find and I tested these capacitors this these Jamicons on a on our network analyzer the impedance analyzer at work and they're actually 7 milliohms uh, each uh, 70 milliohms each which 10 in parallel about 7 milliohms I didn't test the whole bank um, Hopefully these 500 microfarads of uh, capacitance and ceramics is going to help lower that uh, in resistance a bit further. We also have massive amounts of uh, leaded solder to connect all of these in parallel. And this gets soldered right here. As closely as possible and with as much solder as possible. And then you get to 
actually testing the thing and you'll have to give me a few moments to swap things around here, resolder these and prepare a short demonstration because yeah, it's kind of an involved process. It needs uh, two power supplies, it needs the oscilloscope, it needs a signal generator, etc, etc. So hopefully I there's at least another couple of people watching to this point. Um, I've done a lot of talking and explaining, but um, there is a lot of information that needs to be distributed uh, about this thing. Also, uh, many thanks to Mark and um, Bogdan again and um, other people on the Discord server um, for helping me with uh, this project over the course of the past few weeks as I've worked on it. Uh, they, already being much smarter than I am, have improvements that I would have never thought about. Um, and I'm actually working on a second version of the PCB, which should be smaller and faster and better, and uh, which should have none of the bodges that I had to do on uh, this version. So, as you can see, this is still a four-layer board. No, six layers, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, two of the layers are going to be ditched because I don't need uh, six layers. And um, yeah, uh, the layout is, is far tidier. And um, I'll keep you posted on that one. But first of all, let's get this one tested and see if it actually works. Well, I know it works because I've already tested it, but you know, let me show it to you. I'll be right back. So as you can see, hopefully, that's this thing with focus. I soldered, soldered the um, capacitor bank as close to the PCBs that I could uh, could get. These heat sinks, these are amazing. I actually just looked up uh, heat sinks in Altium's manufacturer part search, and lo and behold, these popped up. Um, they're surface mount, they're made for stuff like high power operational amplifiers that are mounted on, uh, that are surface mount, and they're great. I actually didn't uh, need the thermal switch because after minutes on end of running full tilt, because the MOSFET is so low RDS on and because everything is so, so nice, and the heat sinks uh, dissipated so much power due to the massive uh, heat transfer path, um, I didn't even feel this getting too warm, so it peaked at around, I don't know, 70 degrees or something like that. Um, okay, so I'll, uh, I just soldered these back. These, these are the plus minus 15 volts uh, rails. I'm going to switch the camera angle around to the um, side of the lab bench that has uh, most of the test equipment and I'll show you what test equipment I'm using and how and then I'll point the camera at the oscilloscope screen because they don't have any other fancy way of uh, capturing the oscilloscope screen and I'll show you the um, procedure to verify like the rise time and the uh, behavior of the circuit and then we'll intentionally detune the circuit a bit so you can see what happens, right? I'll be right back. Right, so this got um, a bit out of hand. So I have my 63, 6309B power supply serving as the 1.3 volts ish output. This is only a 3 amp power supply, but um, when you can connect it to uh, 10,000 microfarads of capacitance, yeah, uh, plus minus uh, 15 volts go into the device from here. Um, it's actually set to 14.8, I don't know why, it doesn't matter. No, that's better. Uh, signal generator uh, providing the pulse, and I have a T connector with um, BNC to SMA adapters, because I have SMA connectors on the board. 
uh, signal, control signal is going both to the oscilloscope and to the um, board itself. And um, on the oscilloscope, I have a bit of a um, connector situation. Please don't judge me. I will show you that in just a second. Right, so deepest apologies for um, the SMA to N N to BNC and BNC to BNC sex adapter thing here. Um, that's the control signal and if I enable the power supply you can see the pulse output and you can see the power supply is uh, trying its best there. I'm going to intentionally alter the tuning of the circuit by the way, it's not even getting warm at uh, this point. I turned it off just to, um, you know, uh, prevent Bozo from appearing. And I found a screwdriver, which will get, so you can see that if I change the capacitance value for the trimmer capacitor, I can get a uh, response effect. And I'm not going to fiddle with the gain because that was very, very hard to do. And if I change the FET compensation, uh, you'll see that the trailing edge gets some weird artifacting, which is non desirable. And if we hit measure and we, sorry, if we hit measure and measure the rise time, sorry, it's 600 ish nanoseconds. 600 and something. Let's go and... 640 nanoseconds. I don't know if you can see down there, but that is almost as good as uh, Jim's uh, thing, like the um, result Jim had. So I would call this a major success. Let me turn off the power supply before it gets angry at me. And... Um, I don't know how to wrap this video up other than to tell you that um, yeah it was very very exciting very interesting I was out over the moon when I saw it working um, and uh, I'll make some more changes have the uh, I have the PCBs for the second version already on their way and uh, once everything is done, I will put up a GitHub repository with all the source files, uh, the uh, layout, the bill of materials, the schematics, everything, everything. So you can use them as you please. Um, please don't sell this idea because it's not mine. It's uh, Jim Williams's. I'm pretty sure that uh, other commercial products exist. But um, it would be great to keep this an open source project and um, have it improved by the other brilliant minds that are, um, you know, working on electronics uh, these days. So uh, that's it for this one. Uh, it's not that uh, short, not that long either. I hope it will be interesting to watch and. Uh, I'm very close to a thousand subscribers and I feel the need to thank all of you wonderful people for helping me get to something that I would never believe I would have gotten to. And um, uh, take care of yourselves and stay safe and have a great weekend. Bye.